Whether you felt the annoying static shock from walking on a carpet, received a nasty zap from doing electrical work, or seen firsthand why grounding is really important courtesy of LiveLeak, you know that electricity is dangerous. The concept of electrocution is very simple. Electricity passes through your body, damaging vital organs, leading to death. However, the actual science of electrocution is a very complex process, with many variables that can determine whether or not it's fatal. We'll look at these factors and see just how they work. Quick announcement, Questions for Science has first ever merch. Infographic posters for Anatomy of a Headshot, Anatomy of Decapitation, and Anatomy of Electrocution. They're a great conversation starter, and they look great anywhere. And there's also mugs, teas, and notebooks. Link in description. The word electrocution is originally a portmanteau of electric and execution. In May of 1889, New York State found William Kemmler of Buffalo, New York, a street merchant guilty of murdering his common-law wife, Matilda Ziegler, by striking her 26 times in the head with a hatchet. The method of execution was the electric chair, known as electric execution. A New York Times journalist changed the name from electric execution to electrocution, and the name stuck. So what is electricity exactly? Electricity is trillions and trillions of electrons being pushed through a material by an electric field. The electric field strips off electrons that have a weak attraction to the nucleus of the atom, called valence electrons. When you place a strip of zinc and copper into a potato and connect them with a wire and an LED, the electric field pushes electrons toward positively charged copper ions, generating a flow of electrons, and is electricity. But don't be fooled, even in a simple potato battery, there's still trillions of electrons being moved across the wire. In fact, in one milliamp of current, which is so low, it's barely felt by human senses, there's 6.24 quadrillion electrons moving across the wire per second. When electrons move through a material such as a copper wire, they collide with hundreds of trillions of copper atoms, ions, and other electrons. These collisions cause friction, and friction, as you know, produces heat. In fact, this is how heating coils in your toaster work. You send electrons through the wire, causing collisional friction. This in turn causes heat, which makes the coil glow red hot. So now you can make bread into toast. Copper, aluminum, gold, and silver atoms have weakly bonded electrons on the outermost orbital, so they're easily pulled off. This allows the atoms to therefore contribute to the flow and not act as an impediment. This makes copper, aluminum, gold, and silver great conductors of electricity. Because again, wires made of these materials impede very little electron flow. A good conductor in the human body is your nervous system, which is made to send electrical signals to your muscles. Just as there's conductors that allow for easier electron flow, there's also materials that make electron flow very difficult. These materials are called insulators. Common insulators are rubber, plastic, and glass. They cause more friction for electrons because the atoms that make up the materials do not generate free electrons. Electricity requires more energy to pass through insulators due to this increased friction. This is why conductive copper wires are coated in rubber, to prevent flow of electricity out of the wire. If you take an insulator and adjust the properties so it's a little less restrictive and allows some electrons to flow through it, it becomes a resistor. The purpose of a resistor is to lower the voltage in a circuit for a component downstream, so it's not damaged by high voltage. Like this resistor for my LED. If I remove the resistor from the circuit, the voltage will be too high and destroy the LED. Insulators can also break down and burn like resistors if there's a high enough voltage. A good insulator in the human body is your skin. Your skin acts as a pretty good insulator. It's not made of anything conductive at all. The top layer is a mixture of oil and dead skin cells. It's pretty thick and fairly dry. The degree of how well an insulator or resistor restricts flow is called resistance, and is measured in a unit called the ohm. For example, rubber has resistance between 10 and 100 mega ohms. This resistor is 47 kilo ohms, and this resistor is just 15 ohms. In ideal conditions where your skin is dry and there's no open wound, your skin has a resistance of about 100,000 ohms. When electricity passes through your skin, the high amount of resistance generates heat. And just like this resistor, when there's a high enough voltage, the skin burns. During electric chair executions, a sponge soaked in salt water was placed under the cap on the prisoner's head to lower resistance of the skin. This allowed electricity to pass through more efficiently, thereby avoiding severe burns and executing the prisoner more humanely. 
If the skin were dry, it would take more energy and time to push the electricity through the highly resistive skin, causing gruesome burns as well as a slow and painful execution. Once the electricity passes your skin and goes into your body, how lethal it is depends on the path it takes, the duration of the shock, and the intensity of the voltage. Wait, voltage? I thought it's the current that kills you. Some people say it's the current that kills you, and those people are wrong. It's both the voltage and current that kill you, because you can't have current without voltage. It's believed that current alone kills you because you get burned from electrons causing friction in your tissue. And well, technically, current is the number of electrons moving per second. But again, no current without voltage. It makes sense to use water as an analogy. If you pump water through a pipe, the voltage is the pressure acting on the water, and the current is the number of water molecules flowing through the pipe per second. The higher the pressure, the more molecules are moving per second. The lower the pressure, the slower and less molecules will move. And if there is no pressure at all, the water stops. Hopefully it's making sense. In the body, electricity takes the path that is most conductive. In this case, it's your nerves, since they're made to send electrical signals. The two ways electricity kills you is through thermal burns and nerve disruption. The degree of damage depends on the number of electrons moving in your body per second, which as said before, is technically current. We'll see what effects different levels of current have on the body and how much is lethal. By the way, all current being discussed here is specifically direct current or DC. I'll be covering AC a bit later. Let's start with 1 milliamp of current. This amperage is too low to cause any pain, it's so low that it only registers as a tingling sensation on the skin. If we increase to 6 milliamps, the sensation changes to an uncomfortable and mildly painful vibrating sensation. It's been described as painful internal tremors that travel up the hand and into the arm. In the film Taken, when Brian Mills interrogates the Albanian human trafficker, the bodily reactions and pain the trafficker receives from the electricity is similar to what 6 milliamps of current would do to the body. It's not enough to cause burns or outright kill you at first, but it becomes very painful and more dangerous the longer it's sent through your body. At about 15 milliamps is when current begins to become potentially lethal. The electric field generated by current with this intensity is enough to cause forced muscle contractions in a phenomenon known as no let go. Muscles will contract without your control and stay contracted as long as current of 15 milliamps or higher is passing through your nervous system. This typically occurs when someone grabs an ungrounded wire with their hand and cannot let go. It doesn't have to do with your muscles, but rather your nerves. Your nerve cells have protein channels embedded in their membranes that open based on the presence of a voltage, hence why they're called voltage-gated channels. When your nerves send an electrical signal, voltage from the signal causes sodium protein channels to open. Once opened, sodium ions flow into the cell, making the interior positively charged. This causes voltage across the next cell causing the next set of sodium channels to open. This continues till the nerve fiber reaches the muscle it's attached to. Once the final electrical signal reaches the nerve axon, neurotransmitters get released that cause muscle proteins to contract, resulting in a muscle contraction. Sodium ions then flow out of the cell. The inside becomes negatively charged, the channels close, and another contraction can occur. When a current of 15 milliamps or more flows through your nervous system, the electric field causes the voltage-gated protein channels to change shape. Ions flow into the cell, making it positively charged, causing the whole contraction process to occur. As long as current is flowing through the nerves, the voltage-gated protein channels will stay open, and the nerve cell cannot reset its charge back to negative, so the muscle stays contracted. This is why you physically cannot let go. 15 milliamps isn't enough to kill you with a single shock or stop your heart, but it's enough to cause fatal burns. If no one is around to help free you, then you will die. From second and third degree burns, both externally and internally to your nervous system, tissue, and organs, cooking you from the inside out. There was a video in 2019 that made its rounds on the internet of an airport employee in Yemen that was fatally electrocuted. The employee was moving a fan that was not properly grounded. When he grabbed the fan, his body immediately tensed up and became distorted due to forced muscle contractions. During this time he was being shocked, he appeared to be conscious for several seconds, struggling to get help. This indicates the current was not high enough to instantly kill him, but was enough to induce the no let go threshold. As time went on, his skin turned red from blood vessels bursting due to tissue destruction. As a result, the worker succumbed to his injuries. This video illustrates the dangers of the no let go threshold. 
The no let go threshold applies to current from 15 milliamps and up. The only difference with higher current is it causes more severe burns in less time. 50 milliamps is when current becomes very fatal, especially if it passes through the chest, causing respiratory paralysis or shutdown of the lungs. Even if you're shocked for a second, the current is so strong it causes the diaphragm muscles to undergo tetanic contractions. Tetanic contractions are powerful muscle contractions that occur for 90 seconds or longer due to excessive stimuli, essentially causing the muscle fibers to stay in a locked state. This can also happen because the basic unit of muscle, the sarcomere, can become damaged from the forced contractions and cannot relax, keeping it in a contracted state. For muscle in your arms and legs, this is not a big deal. Sure, muscle is locked for a few seconds, but it's not life-threatening. However, with muscle in your diaphragm, which is needed to keep you breathing, this can be fatal. 100 milliamps of current or higher will kill you with a single shock. The current is strong enough that it disrupts sodium and potassium ion channels in the heart's internal signaling system. This disruption alters the firing of the heart's electrical system, causing ventricular defibrillation. Normally, to pump blood, your ventricles have to contract in a coordinated cycle. In ventricular defibrillation, ventricles of the heart contract in a disorganized and chaotic rhythm, preventing them from pumping blood. Due to the lack of pumping blood, ventricular defibrillation can be fatal within minutes. Any current above 100 milliamps of DC has a very high probability of killing you. But this whole discussion has been about DC or direct current. What about AC or alternating current? After all, it's used in most industrial and residential power. For starters, AC is much more lethal at lower currents than DC, which has to do with how the electricity is generated. Direct current is generated by separating a positive and negative charge, and then placing a connection between the two. Once connected, the electrons flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. The flow of electrons stays the same like a flowing stream. To generate alternating current, a magnet is rotated inside a loop of copper wire. The magnetic field pulls loose electrons from the copper wire, and the electrons flow back and forth based on the magnet's rotation. The current that is generated by the rotation of the magnet oscillates with the intensity of the magnet's position. The current increases, decreases, hits zero, and then repeats. If the AC were at 60 Hz, this means the current would be turning on and off 60 times per second. You can actually see this if you slow down the illumination of a light bulb powered by AC. Recall with DC, while the current is flowing, your muscles stay contracted. And when the current stops, your muscles relax. For AC, since the current is turning on and off 60 times a second, your muscles are also contracting and relaxing 60 times per second. This violent contracting and relaxing causes serious damage to your heart and other muscles in your body, to the point that bone can actually be fractured from the muscle contractions. This oscillating current makes AC much more dangerous than DC, which is why it doesn't need to be as high to cause a fatal injury. As little as 30 milliamps of AC is lethal. This is why AC is used in electric chair executions, because it requires less voltage and is more effective at killing the prisoner. Electric chairs supply about 2,000 volts of AC through the cranial cavity of the prisoner. To ensure a faster death due to electricity damaging the brain and the central nervous system, once the switch is flipped, alternating current of about 9 to 10 amps flows through the brain and enters the central nervous system, causing the prisoner to lose consciousness immediately. Current travels through nerve fibers to the ground plate attached at the prisoner's calf. As the alternating current passes through, it burns nerve fibers and tissue from the inside out, and causes violent contract and relax cycles in the muscles, which is why the body is strapped down. According to the Florida Electric Chair Execution Protocol, the electricity is turned on and off a total of three times. It's first turned on for 8 seconds, then turned off. It's turned on again for 22 seconds, then off again. The third time it's turned on for 4 seconds. The cause of death is destruction of the brain and central nervous system from electrical burns, as well as burns and muscular damage to the heart. And that's the anatomy of electrocution.